Welcome to episode number 320 of Category 5 Technology TV. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. And I'm your co-host, Erica Lalonde. Erica, what's coming up? Well, take a l- closer look at the news coming up. Um, Chromate, the new chroma key technology, will be bringing up to Studio uh, D with your help. Web developers... Sorry, we just have the wrong page there. There we go. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's not the first blonde good. thing I've done today. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, so. talk, we'll talk a little bit later about a couple of the antics before the show. <laughs> That's all right. Just for fun. <laughs> Coming up in the newsroom, Netflix has started testing ultra-high definition 4K video. Uh, D-Ban is threatening to switch X, uh, F- FCE uh, uh, if GOME 3 doesn't bring back more comfortable interface. Uh, a robot has been developed that can win rock, paper, scissors every time. And BlackBerry shares have plunged after they announced they're abandoning their sell-off plan. Hmm. Stick around for these stories coming up later in the show. Thanks, Erica. Tonight, we are going to take a closer look at the new Chroma Key technology as you started to read into my lines, but it's called Chromat. We're going to take a lo- closer look, show you how it works behind the scenes. Uh, also, web developers, you don't want to miss out on tonight's show. We're going to show you how to actually deploy a Windows 8.1 virtual machine on your Linux computer so that you can test your websites and your web applications with Internet Explorer 11. Uh, that's awesome stuff. Don't go anywhere. Uh, it is November 5th. This is episode number 320, and it's going to be a great show. Stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hillary Rumble. Krista Wells. Eric Kidd. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. At EcoAlkalines, we believe you should be able to trust your batteries not just here, but here, here, and here. But with one exception, you should also be able to trust your batteries here. EcoAlkalines are the world's first and only certified carbon neutral battery manufactured to the highest standards of recycling and quality, without any trace amounts of harmful chemicals like mercury, lead, or cadmium. EcoAlkalines provide performance that rivals leading national alkaline battery brands at a comparable price. Find out more about the EcoAlkalines difference. EcoAlkalines.com Now here's something we're really excited about bringing to Category 5's Studio D with your help. It's called Chromat from Reflect Media. Now with the traditional chroma key green screen studio, of course we'd have to paint the walls green. And that brings with it a problem. Green reflections. So, of course, you know, my skin, uh, sometimes our clothes and products that we're displaying are going to actually reflect the green that's around us. So that becomes a problem and it makes it hard to key. So, of course, everybody who has ever built a green screen studio knows what does that mean? You got to bring in more lights. So in come the lights and you've got all these great big soft boxes. They generate a lot of heat. They use a lot more electricity. And here's the kicker. They use up a lot of your floor space. We want to avoid that completely. That's where Reflect Media comes in. This stuff's amazing. We've got a light ring adapter on this camera, and we place one of these on each of our cameras here at Category 5. And then with the fl- uh, the simple flip of a switch on this controller module, and you'll see that the gray screen that I'm standing in front of automatically turns into this perfect chroma key green. And it's perfectly illuminated. I didn't have to bring in any extra lighting. So what that means is we're able to utilize all the space of Studio D. You'll see that to the naked eye, it's still just a gray screen. But to this one camera, it's perfect chroma key green. So now we've got all that extra space that we're not using for lights, and we're able to, for example, enhance our news segment, make it look like a professional network broadcast. Or perhaps you'd like to see Category 5 Technology TV broadcasting from a multi-million dollar studio. 
Well, or so it seems. I mean, everything around me is, of course, virtual. But that is what your contribution can bring to Category 5 TV. We're not just building a studio. What we're doing is we're enhancing Category 5. We're taking ourselves to the next level and taking your show, propelling it into the future. This is going to mean so much to Category 5 Technology TV, all of these technologies culminating together. I know $88,500 sounds like a lot of money, but all of us working together, we can do this, and Category 5 is going to be better than ever. Broadcasting since 2007, Category 5 Technology TV has grown year after year, faithfully bringing viewers hundreds of one-hour episodes focused on helping with their tech questions, assisting with the migration to Linux and other open source alternatives, presenting new and interesting tech products, and providing insightful interviews and demonstrations. All this is provided free of charge. We are now in our seventh season, and it's time to improve the viewing experience, make the show look and sound great. We continue our focus on fun, educational broadcasting. Stand with us as we build a brand new studio for Category 5 Technology TV. Bringing Category 5 TV to the world with better visuals, full 1080p video, and a permanent sound isolated studio. We have big dreams and we want you to be a part of them. Please support Category 5 Technology TV. Visit cat5.tv slash studio to be a part of our crowdfunding campaign for a limited time. With contributor perks brought to you in part by Category 5 Technology TV. Bag to nature compostable garbage bags. Eco Alkaline's environmentally responsible batteries. Free play human powered devices. NetTalk Duo 2 with free calls to the USA and Canada and no monthly phone bill and the Android-powered Magic Mini PC. We thank you for your support. Please visit cat5.tv slash studio today. This is Category 5 Technology TV. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. And I'm your co-host, Erica Lalonde. Good to see you. Yes, good to see you. How you been? I've been really well, actually. Yeah, good, good. How you been? Well, nice to see you at home. Yeah, it's nice to see everyone. Hoping everyone's doing really well now that the cold season's coming in. Mm, true enough. Mm -hmm. and I'm looking forward to skiing this year. Yeah, I guess that's coming, eh? Now, oh, yeah. have they already started laying down snow at the uh, the snow hills and things? Um, I'm actually... Getting cold enough. Yeah, it's definitely getting cold enough, but they haven't started yet. All right. But I'll let you guys know when they do. <laughs> it's in, we're in Canada here, so, you know, I figured July, definitely. <laughs> maybe well, not. maybe if you're out west, yeah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> All right. Um, But... Other than that, um, I've just been in school and, uh, you know, enjoying my nice house. Um, and I'm out of residence, so I'm living in my own place now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So I'm like, not like a thousand raging college students. It's just like a couple uh, of roommates. You can focus on your studies and that's good. Yeah. House parties. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <That's> your studies? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, you were on the show a while back, and we did the nostalgic, nostalgic gaming episode where we looked at some old, old classic mm -hmm. games. That was a lot of fun and, and a very popular episode on YouTube, as a matter of fact. Um, and so we've, we've taken it upon ourselves to look at some nostalgic games that are available on modern PCs since that time just to kind of keep that, that dream alive. Do you remember Hover? On Windows 95. Hover. Hover. It took me a minute, too. I was thinking, hover, hover, hover. Was that a, like a space game? It was like a, it was kind of like a 3D maze game. I don't remember. It was, it was a long, you know, I remember uh, Descent. Mm -hmm. And then Hover came with Windows 95. It was a free game that came with it. It was the first time ever that an operating system hmm. came with an actual 3D game. It was astounding. So, no, I've never actually played it. Hover.ie in your browser is going to take you to a remake from Microsoft. And it's actually in your browser. You can, in fact, use the, the video game Hover from Windows 95. They've, of course, uh, they've stepped things up and made it look a lot better uh, with m more modern graphics and things like that. But this is what the internet has come to is that. That was cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you, some of you might recall this right away. As no. soon as, as soon as Never you start playing, it. it's like, oh yeah, I remember this. Those were the days. I 
play games similar to this. Yeah. Very boxy. Right. <laughs> so that's available in your web browser. And you can actually get there through cat5.tv slash hover, just to keep it simple. Cat5.tv slash hover. But that game came with Windows 95, and now you can actually run it in your browser, which, you know, that's, wow. that's where technology has, has been progressing. Everything's becoming web-based. Mm -hmm. which is you know quite interesting because way back when you had to have giant sized hard drives so that you can install all your applications and run them locally now it's becoming progressively more and more server based and in fact hover uh, at, at that website is multiplayer up to six players That's right through fun. your browser nothing to install just for perfect. no reason other than nostalgia so check it out cat5.tv slash hover and we'd also like to thank all the viewers who have sent in donations to our Indiegogo project to rebuild the studio. It's been exciting seeing uh, your contributions come in, and we appreciate every contribution that has uh, arrived. Uh, we have just uh, just under a month before the end of the campaign at this point so we'd encourage people if you're if you're on the fence or, or thinking about donating or uh, perhaps you are planning to but you just haven't done it yet uh, we'd encourage you to please do that cat5.tv slash studio uh, just to give us that extra kind of kick forward so that we can prepare for studio d and all the exciting stuff that's going to be happening with that um, our mobile site, of course, just to get through a couple of things right off the bat, m.cat5.tv. You can scan that QR code or visit it through your mobile device's browser, m.cat5.tv. And we'd also like to welcome our new registered viewers. Yeah, we've got a few this week, eh? Yeah, we got uh, Brill, Brills Radio, ah. The Brin. The Burn. The Burn. Or the Burn. The Burn. And I'm Tech5, yeah. Welcome to the show. You can register for free at category5.tv. Thank you for registering on our website as well. And that is going to allow you to be, uh, to be able to participate in some contests. And Erica, we've got some Eco Alkalines batteries mm -hmm. that we're giving away. Um, it's on the calendar. You can find out more information. I think it's two weeks away that we're actually giving this away. We've got several packs of batteries that are basically like this. Um, so it's a box full of, this has got 24 AAA batteries. I've got 24 AA batteries. We've got C batteries, D batteries, nine volts, all that we're giving away. Uh, and what you need to do is just get into the chat room if you're watching live right now and just tell us your state or province uh, and uh, if you're watching this after the fact uh, all you have to do is email me live at category5.tv we'd like to receive your username what you'd like to, us to call you on air as well as your province or state and uh, we'll uh, cast your ballot in that draw in a couple weeks time so really excited to be sending away uh, yet another EcoAlkalines prize. Check them out, ecoalkalines.com. They are certified carbon neutral e uh, alkaline batteries uh, with no cadmium, no mercury, no lead. Uh, the, probably the most environmentally friendly uh, batteries that you could find. So we love them here. And also Category 5 TV is a member of the Tech Podcast Network uh, for your modern web browser at um, cat5. Dot t um, and if it's tech, it's here. Thank you. We're also a member of the International Association of Internet Broadcasters, and uh, we are just about set to jump into our feature tonight. <laughs> All right. It's always fun, isn't it? It is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All the fun stuff that happens behind the scenes, and we'll carry on. Okay, so tonight I want to show you how you can actually virtualize Windows 8.1. We've been hearing about Windows 8.1, which has just recently been released, and people are getting the update and having to get their systems up and running. But as a web developer, here's the thing, Erica, is that we need to be able to test our websites on an operating system that now a lot of people are switching to, but we don't necessarily want to switch to that operating system ourselves. Right. So in a case like that, well, what do we do? Well, we turn to virtualization. Virtualization allows us to run another operating system on our what we'll call our host operating system. In my case, I'm running Linux. In fact, I'm running a, a distro of Linux called Point Linux, and it looks like this. So it's a fairly familiar interface. Even if you're a Windows user, you won't have any trouble getting around Point Linux. Uh, we have links on our website, and I will post links for you in the show notes of episode number 320. 
Uh, now, what we need is a tool called Oracle VirtualBox. And if you've got it installed, you'll find it under System Tools. And you'll see that I do, in fact, have that. So as I bring it up, there it is. And this is a virtualization platform so that I can create virtual machines, not real physical. So it's, it's like I can install mm. Windows, I can install Linux, I can install other operating systems within a virtual space and run them as, as if they're applications on my computer. So that's, that's very smart. I like it's that cool. idea. And if I need to use, say, a particular Windows application, in our case tonight, it's Internet Explorer 11. If mm -hmm. I need to access that, and it's not a program I can install on Linux, then I can, through virtualization, op operate that application. So similarly, of course, we can deduce that, okay, well, if you need Photoshop or QuickBooks for business, you can use virtualization to then create an environment where, yeah, you can run Linux as your main operating system, so you're not susceptible to viruses. You don't have to worry about uh, you know, the kinds of threats that are out there attacking Windows users but you can still have Windows as a virtual machine so that you can still operate those needed applications. So tonight I want to walk you through how we're going to do this. We're going to grab the tool that we need from uh, a particular website. First of all, if you, if you don't, I mentioned you need uh, VirtualBox. If you don't have it yet, you can in fact find it in Synaptic Package Manager or your favorite uh, package installation utility. Uh, you can also use apt-get, but you'll see if I do a quick search, VirtualBox. There it is right there. So by installing that, mark for installation, uh, you would be able to get that. You'll see that I'm actually using a different repository, which I've got off of virtualbox.org. If you want some of the non-free components, you can do that. And so I've installed VirtualBox-4.2. So all we need to do is bring up this particular website here. We're going to go to modern.ie and just hit enter on that website. And on that website, you'll see the first thing that you see is developer tools, and we've got download virtual machines for Mac, Linux, or Windows. And we're just going to click on that link. Next up, we can choose Linux as our desired testing OS. That's the host. Select our virtualization platform, as we mentioned, is VirtualBox for Linux. And then it gives us a whole ton of links. Well, what do we want to test on? IE6? No thanks. Uh, IE8? Perhaps if uh, you're developing for some older systems. But remember, XP is gone as of April. So if you're still running XP, you need to upgrade because web developers are no longer going to be developing for it, and neither are application developers. OK, so IE7, IE8. So IE8 on Windows 7 is obsolete. IE10 on win Windows 7, people are still running. So that's cool. You might want to try with that. So these are each of these are a virtual machine. So you may want to try, you may want to actually download and deploy multiple of these. You might want to try uh, IE 10 on Windows 7 as well as IE 10 on Windows 8 to see if the uh, user experience is any different between those two uh, operating systems. You might, uh, you may want to try IE 10 in Windows 7 to test your web application and then try IE 11 preview in Windows 8.1 so that you can get that experience and see what it's going to look like on these new Windows tablets and so on and so forth. So what we're going to do, we're going to start with the highest one of them all, IE 11 preview on Windows 8.1 preview. Now we can sit here right clicking and save link as and do that over and over again for all four files. But we're talking probably, you know, there's probably about two gigs worth of files there when it's all said and done. So we're going to simplify this. You'll see that there's a Linux virtualbox.txt and if you click on it it's just got a list of the links to the other files well what what good is that well we're on linux so we can actually use that as a source for a script i'm going to copy that to my clipboard copying the link location see that and so we're going to actually use that as an input file for a program called wget so let's go over to, uh, let's say our temp folder is where we want to download it, and we will say wget-i for the input file, and then paste that link. And so what it's going to do is it's actually, in fact, not just going to download the text file, it's going to read the text file, find those other three links, and say, okay, I'm going to download those three files as well. Mm -hmm. So just in one real quick fell swoop, we can hit enter on that, and you'll see that it's all of a sudden downloading all these files. So there it comes, Windows 8 Preview for Linux VirtualBox Part 1 Self-Extractor. Now, that's going to take a few minutes to come down. 
and that's just the first file. So there, we know that there are th two more files coming after that. Mm -hmm. So I've taken the liberty of just down pre-downloading those before the show just so that we can expedite things a little bit for us tonight. So I've placed those in a folder on my desktop. I downloaded them in exactly the same way so you can follow along. And in this folder, you'll see those four files are there. So we've got this SFX file we don't really know what to do with, right? And it doesn't give us anything to do with it. And if we try to open it, it's just going to say it could not display. And then we've got a RAR file. And if we want to try extracting the, <laughs> pardon me, the RAR file, well, it says that there's no such file or directory, nothing's working. And the reason for that, so, you know, I show you the, the potential problems so that you mm -hmm. can say, oh, okay, Robbie showed me that problem. So now I know how to get around that. The thing is, is that they've set this up as a RAR self-extractor. That's why part one is not a dot .rar file, it's a dot .sfx. So what we actually want to do is right click on the SFX file, that's the self extractor, and go properties. I'm going to do this through the GUI just to show you. Permissions, and you'll see allow executing the file as a program. So once I've allowed that, now I can either do this through terminal or I'm just going to double click on that and it seems to do nothing except there's this new file that suddenly popped up and you'll see it's only 12.6 megabytes. But if I hit the <coughs> pardon me, the F5 key on my keyboard to refresh, you'll see that it's in fact getting bigger and bigger and bigger because that script is working in the background to extract that file. Through the terminal you would actually receive more out, uh, visual output so you would actually see the progress of the extraction but in our case because we're doing this through the GUI we don't actually see the progress so we just hit F5 to see when it's done. We can tell when it's done because it's going to stop getting bigger when we hit F5. F5, 1.2 gigs. I'm guessing that this file based on the other three files we've got 1, 2, 2.6 gigs. Oh no, 2, two gigs. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a little bit over 2 gigs. So, almost there. Any questions for us in the chat room? Just pop those over to Category 5 on Freenode, and Erica is watching that for us. One of the things, if there aren't any questions just yet, that I'll mention is that you see that this is an OVA file that is being extracted here. So what is an OVA file? First of all, OVF is an open virtualization format file, which is basically the folder of an entire virtual machine. It contains the, the, not only the virtual hard drive, uh, but it also contains the information about the machine itself. How much RAM does it have? What kind of graphic adapter, virtual graphic adapter does it have? Um, it's basically a contained, an OVF is a contained virtual machine in its entirety so that you can import it without having to recreate any of the settings. An OVA is simply a tar of that fo of that folder, so it's uh, basically the uh, Linux equivalent of, say, a zip file, so that everything is contained within one file, and it's nicely compressed and compacted. So it looks like that's done. It's at 2.8 gigabytes, and it hasn't moved up since then, so we know that it's done. Okay, so I'm going to double click. It's this easy. I'm going to because I have VirtualBox installed. All I'm going to do is double click on that new OVA file. VirtualBox is immediately going to open up and say, oh, hey, look, I've got a new appliance here. What is it? Windows 8.1 Preview. It's going to use the guest OS type of Windows 8. One CPU, one gig of RAM. It's got a DVD player. It's got USB controller and this and that. AV8 or AHCI on the hard disk controller. So it's all pre-configured. I don't have to figure out any of the settings or figure out how to get Windows 8 to boot on my Linux host. So I'm going to say, okay, yeah, looks good. Import. Could it be that simple? Maybe. 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 Well, we'll see. Let's see. All right. I'm going to reiterate, too, that this was all done legitimately and no cost. No, uh, no having to pay for these files or anything like that. Everything is free as in cost. It says 22 minutes remaining. I know my computer's faster than that, so <laughs> it's not actually going to take that long, I'll guarantee you. Two percent. Two percent. It's like watching a kettle. Uh, it gets boring. 23 minutes. No, not a chance. That would just... <laughs> no. Can you just... imagine that, that being the show? Let's just watch a progress indicator for 27 <laughs> minutes, folks. No. But this is happening live. We're doing this live in real time. 18 minutes. There, we just knocked off three minutes. Four minutes. And oh, oh. Oh, 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 kicked it into gear. 
There we go. 99%. And count down from three. Take a deep breath. Could it be done? Yes. Bam! We have a Windows 8.1 preview virtual machine now completely configured and ready to boot, right? Well, no. What we need to do first and foremost, right click on it, go settings. We always do this when we create a virtual machine because everything's there, but look at this network. Your network adapter has not yet been attached. Why is that? Well, because the OVA file was created on a different machine with a different network adapter than your host. So what we need to do is we need to go into those settings and say, okay, let's use my network adapter, my actual physical network adapter. So we're going to go attached to bridged adapter. Mine happens to be ETH0. You might have a different one in there or multiple. Make sure you select the one that is in use for your connection. Once I've done that, anything else that I want to do, you might want to, if you're going to use this for more than just testing, you may want to enable 3D acceleration and you may want to crank up some of the, uh, the memory on that card. So let's do that. We're going to have 3D acceleration turned on and hit OK. So now our Windows 8.1 preview is ready to go. Double click on it to boot. Here we go. So this is what I mean, Erica, by a virtual machine, uh, basically a computer mm -hmm. within a computer. Now Windows 8 is booting as a, a basically a program on my computer. So everything that Windows 8 can do, I can do in this program window. Or for the ultimate experience, what I can do is I can in fact press huh. the right control key and the F key on my keyboard and that switches to full screen. So now my virtual machine is practically going to feel like I'm running a Windows, Windows 8. 8 on my computer. But all I have to do to get out of it is simply close it. It's running like a program. That is actually amazing. So, you know, I've got, I can minimize it. There, I've minimized Windows 8.1 preview to my taskbar. <laughs> it's like there it is. Minimizing a mini operating system. Just like that. How do you like that? It's almost <laughs> booted. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> We're setting things up for Doing you. everything you. for you. Creepy Windows 8. <laughs> what else have you got for me? Installing, oh, installing apps. apps. Okay. This might take a few minutes. Uh, and then it shows you. Oh, and then it went blue. Oh, no, that's kind of more of a purple. purple. Let's start. See, whenever I get Windows and it goes blue, I, I expect the worst. <laughs> okay, so here we are in Windows 8.1 preview. Okay, so I'm going to go into my desktop just by clicking. Oh, okay, I double clicked. There we are. And you'll notice, of course, down at the bottom, there is a Internet Explorer icon. Oops! My start button is also what I use to zoom, and apparently Windows 8 likes to say, oh, you wanted, you wanted to go back to that tile thing, because <laughs> you pushed the Windows button, so you must want that crazy blocky thing. It's Not so much. <laughs> no. Okay, but there we are. Category5.tv, let's see how we look on Internet Explorer 11. I think that's what we're running here, according to the website that we downloaded it from. Looking good. Yeah, it operates. The virtual machine doesn't seem to perform quite as well as a native operating system, but it gives you a really mm -hmm. good idea of the user experience, how the website is going to look, uh, how it's going to render especially. You may not get a perfect impression of the performance of the website, as is the case for us right now, mm -hmm. um, but it is working and we can see that it works. So there we are with Internet Explorer 11.0.9431 running on Windows 8.1. Looks good. Everything seems to render. There it is. So why do we want to do this again? Because as a web developer, we need to make sure that our websites work for as many people as possible. When we build a website, we want to make sure that mm -hmm. it works. Now, gone are the days where, you know, and, and we say, you know, well, Internet Explorer 6, whatever, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't need to develop for that anymore. But there were days when we basically had to create two copies of every website that we built because Internet Explorer was so far behind all the other browsers. Now, right. with Internet, Internet Explorer 10, Internet Explorer 11 especially, we're starting to see them really uh, grab the reins and, and, and catch up to mm -hmm. Chrome and Firefox as far as standards go. So things work a lot better now. But we still want to be able to see that. We want to be able to test it and make sure that it's going to work well for our users. Similarly, on an upcoming episode of Category 5, we're going to be looking at how to build a pinnable website. 
And what that means, we're going to be able to tap into some of the features of Windows 7, uh, Windows 8 uh, with Internet Explorer, and be able to pin our websites as applications on our taskbar. So um, you don't want to miss out on that. You're going to need one of these virtual machines in order to participate in that feature. Um, so make sure you grab one from modern.ie. That's all there is to it. Windows 8 and a virtual machine. Windows 8.1, I should say. Um, we also had a question yeah. that from TN Frank that does our virtual machine, can we run it on Firefox IE? Can we run, oh, could we put yeah. Firefox on here? Well, it's Windows 8, right? So right. I could go get firefox.com and I could download Firefox and install it in my virtual machine. So there you go. So there's no reason why not. But see, the thing is, is that with Firefox and with Chrome, it's mm -hmm. a little bit different because those, you can install the current versions and past versions in Linux natively. So I can test in Chrome, I can test in Firefox all natively on my operating system, which is Linux. However, Internet Explorer is a Windows only application, so to speak. I know there's Mac version and there are ways to get around, you know, using Wine and stuff. But the truest way to experience Internet Explorer is through Microsoft Windows. Mm -hmm. So that's where this virtual machine comes in. It becomes a testing environment for your Windows users running Internet Explorer. Can you install other browsers in there? Sure, why not? But because you can do those natively as well in Linux, it's not quite as necessary. Thank you very much for the question. And then we also have a question uh, from Tian Frank. So do you actually, we know that it's a testing for web developers, but mm -hmm. do you actually have Windows 8 without having to buy a copy? No, it's not. It's not like a full version of Windows 8. This is called Windows 8 Preview, uh, and it's uh, it is specifically for this particular purpose. It's not like having a. It's not getting a free copy of no. the full yeah. Windows 8. Nothing like that. It's for developers to be able to experience uh, a testing environment for their products. So for me, it's the web applications that I develop. Uh, we need to be able to test them on Microsoft Windows because more and more we're starting to see people buying uh, the Windows tablet systems that you know you're using Windows 8 Windows 8.1 and we want to be able to make sure that our products work on those platforms so that's what this is developed for sure you can download it and test it out and play around with it but it's not likely going to have all the features that you're looking for as a desktop OS mm -hmm. but you can play with it and and at least get a feel, get like it, not yeah. even just for web developers, just for oh, sure. the common user. Yep. From just from if you want to test the interface, maybe you're thinking about upgrading. Here's an yeah, example. Yeah, like I don't have Windows 8, maybe I could upgrade just from seeing from this. Well, you're on Windows 7, say, yeah. and you think, or maybe you're on Windows XP and you're contemplating. And <laughs> so maybe the upgrade is, is something you're considering. Mm -hmm. So here's a chance that you could try Windows 8, see if you like it, and then make the decision after you've played around with it as a virtual machine. Personally, I like the idea of, you know, evaluate all your options. Right. Um, these days, there is the Linux operating system, which is full force, an excellent desktop operating system. Give it a chance, even if it's a little in, in, intimidating um, to change from a Windows platform to Linux. It's okay because, I mean, changing from Windows XP or Windows 7 to Windows 8 is also a big step. It is. It's a completely different interface. Yeah. Changing from Windows to Mac, because a lot of people make that move as well. It's a very big step, and you need to basically relearn your operating system. Linux, as you see, is very easy to use as far as the interface. It's It makes sense. It's it's. I it's know not from installing it on uh, one yep. of my laptops, which I may have destroyed. Um, <laughs> not by installing Linux. No. That might have been a drink or... <laughs> um, that... Let's just say I had a laptop and uh, the keys fell off. I was doing my hair oh. and I put the blow dryer down on my laptop and the uh, blow dryer burnt my keys off. <laughs> so at the time, like I like to be handy dandy woman, oh, yeah. but I took a hot glue gun and put my keys back on the keyboard thinking it would work, but <laughs> I just ended up gluing my keys to my keyboard why and does the Z button just Z, 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 <laughs> And wow. then trying to figure out how to fix it, but it wasn't going to be fixed. Just, just had to once, get all... Once you've hot glued your keys down. <laughs> you're going to... They're not going to fall off now. But no. They, they will never fall so off. Good. You'll never lose your keys, but you may need to buy a new keyboard. You just may. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I thought 
just installing it, I got to know it really well, and I was running two different operating systems on my laptop. We're doing a dual boot. Yeah, yeah. And I was so that's doing another it. option too. And I, I I liked it. I thought it was very interesting. Never got to continue with it because I had to the get hot a hot glue incident. Hot glue incident. <laughs> 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 um, but um, definitely, it was d easy to get to know. Cool. So give it a chance uh, if you're thinking about making the switch. But this is a great way to be able to test your websites, your web applications. It's modern.ie. Check it out and uh, and uh, let us know how it goes. I'd love to hear if that's maybe a tip that has helped you to be able to develop for another platform. Mm -hmm. So I develop pretty much exclusively on Linux. So it really helps me to be able to test now on a platform such as Windows without having to go all out and buy licenses and you know all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um, saves me having to do that saves so. time and money sure does all right well it is time for the news are you ready i are am. you ready i hope you're ready it's I pretty cool ready. <laughs> oh what do you got for us <laughs> uh netflix yes <laughs> so. love you netflix uh netflix has started testing ultra high definition video also known as 4K, uh, the technology offers four times the amount of detail as 1080p and high definition content. Ne Netflix said it plans to offer the first titles in 4K to consumers next year. That's amazing. Can you imagine though the bandwidth requirements of 4K video? I think Ooh. people are, uh, l let's put this into perspective. You think four times the quality and, and it's hard to get your head around mm -hmm. that. So I, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take a piece of paper and I'm going to fold it <laughs> just into a couple of pieces here. Okay. This just kind of puts four times into perspective when it comes to, to video. Okay. So let's pretend this is 1080p. Okay. Which is the best HD that you would Possibly think that you could have. It. Right? So what is 4K versus this? So if this is 1080p... Because this is folded in four pieces. That Damn. is 4K. Does that put it into a little bit of perspective for you? Look at the difference. And that that's literally the, the difference of 4K video. So what's going to happen when, you know, everybody subscribes and starts using 4K video? I would think that it's going to use like 100 megabits of download yeah. speed. And a lot of people, like you in the UK, like what kind of speed are you getting? Um, I think that there's about 15%, 20% of the users in, in the United Kingdom who have those kinds of speeds, like 15 to 20%. So people are, mm -hmm. of course, um, thinking that, oh, well, Netflix, you know, why, would, why are they doing this? They're exceeding um, what consumers have as far as Internet. But didn't they do this once before? Didn't, w when Netflix first came out, wasn't the whole thing well, how can they stream video online mm -hmm. in HD? And yet they did, and yet they do, and yet hopefully we're all subscribed to it and using it. Uh, I'm, I use it I d a I huge do. amount. Yeah. It's fantastic. So if they've done it once before and they pushed the envelope, they pushed the codex, and they pushed um, bandwidth providers, internet service providers to be able to provide the speeds that their customers demand in order to do it, then what's to say they can't do it again with 4K? No, they can. I, I could see they could probably do it again. That's a scary amount of data. <laughs> it is a scary <laughs> amount of data, but the quality will be nice. Let's hope that you've got unlimited bandwidth, folks. <laughs> Let's hope. All right, I've got one for you. Have you used XFCE? Well, you might be using it soon. Uh, about two years ago, or I guess about a year ago, as a matter of fact, Debian was considering the same problem they were saying okay they weren't sure if they wanted to go with gnome 3 or xfce as their default desktop environment xfce of course is a little bit lighter weight um, it's a more familiar interface for people used to the old windows style interface or uh, gnome 2 in a debian git commit post on saturday or pardon me on sunday um, it was actually announced that they are again reviewing xfce as a promising option to replace gnome 3 in the famous Linux distro. The dramatic change is still subject to evaluation before the next major release named Jesse uh, is finalized. So the post states, the evaluation will start around the point of DebConf, which is August of next year. If at that point GNOME looks to be a better choice, it will go back to being the default. So the question that I ask is, is 
Debian actually pushing to switch to XFCE uh, because they could actually be using XFCE to leverage uh, to push GNOME 3 to in fact do what we have all wanted them to do for quite some time and that's bring back the classic interface. And they've given them quite an ultimatum too. Well, if you don't give us a good interface, uh, we're going to pull, pull out and give it to XFCE. So the post goes on to say, and I quote, if GNOME 3 feels comfortable to GNOME 2 and XFCE users, that would go a long way towards switching back to it as the default. Unfortunately, we need to wait about 10 months in order to find out how the GNOME developers are going to reply to this threat of losing their long-standing relationship with Debian and all of its users. But this could mean some exciting developments uh, for us old-school Linux users who love the old-style interface. So, What do you think? I think, that they, I think it's a tactic. Se seems a little bit like they're saying, okay either give us a better interface, which is old mm -hmm. school, or we're pulling the plug. I think that's kind of good. Well, I think we could see some really good improvements in GNOME 3. Looking at the uh, chat room, um, a lot of people are um, getting a lot of uh, feedback on people are more happy with classic menus. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's my thinking exactly. Mm -hmm. I call myself old school, but the fact is I just don't like that everything is now developed for touch screens because my desk has a keyboard and a mouse and a monitor in front of me. That's what I'm using. I'm not getting my screen all dirty in my office. I want to have a desktop operating system, not a tablet operating system. No. So give me the option. When I install the OS, I should be able to say, do I want the desktop version or the tablet version? Don't force it on me. And that's what Ubuntu has done. That's what Debian, or not Debian, pardon me, GNOME 3 has done when they removed uh, the fallback mode. So. Um. And we also have another question. Oh, yeah? um, so as a newbie to Linux from Windows, which uh, distro do you recommend for learning? That is a big question. I like Point Linux right now. Uh, I think it's a really great distribution. Um, also, Zorin OS is a good one uh, to get your feet wet because it has uh, modes that allow you to make it look like Windows, make it look like Mac only because it makes it more familiar to you. So check out Zorin OS and Point Linux. All right, next news story. Um, so, a robot has been developed by Japanese scientists that is so fast it can win the rock, paper, scissors game against a human every single time. It uses high speed recognition and reaction rather than prediction. Techn Wait. <laughs> well, yeah, it's faster than us. Technically, the robot cheats because it reacts extremely quickly to what the human hand is doing rather than making a uh, pre-meditated uh, uh, action as the rule state. Hmm. state uh, taking just one millisecond to recognize what shape the human hand is making, it then chooses a winning move and reacts at high speed. The scientists at University of Tokyo specialize in a range of technologies including replicating and improving upon the human senses using high-speed intelligent robots. Isn't that interesting? And that kind of puts a little bit of a perspective on, well, what's the point? Like, I, I mean, uh, you've got this thing that can do rock, paper, scissors, but it actually observes and responds quicker than probably we could even perceive one millisecond. Mm -hmm. It's able to respond to me going like that or that or that. So like usually I liked playing rock, paper, scissors against people who just had <laughs> slow slow movements. You could kinda like look and then be like, I know they're gonna do I <laughs> so know So you were like a cheating <laughs> robot. <laughs> yeah, I would always look and be like, what are they gonna do? So I'd win because I'm a sore loser sometimes. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> to get their strategy. So well, I would understand, you know, what what they're gonna do next. And I think that um, by looking at reaction, except uh, instead of predicting of what we kind of always mm -hmm. do as like human makes more sense from a robot's perspective right. because they are not intelligent in the way that the human is. Mm -hmm. I wonder, though, uh, we've talked about Ford and the way that they're introducing cars that will automatically swerve to avoid 
um, obstacles and things in a case of, you know, maybe the driver doesn't see someone walk out in front and the car will actually move. So this kind of reactive technology could be in implemented into that kind of thing if it's really that And a safety good. technology as well. And, and you would feel a lot safer knowing that this thing would have whooped you <laughs> at rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> but what I want to know is would it cause a rift in the space-time continuum to put two of these machines head-to-head? -head? What would happen? That's That science. would be cool. Because That's the kind of science I want to see. That would actually be really interesting. Wouldn't it? <laughs> they probably both just sit there going... <laughs> like faking each other out. Just don't know what to do. Or just be like me and wait until the next person moves. <laughs> it's not going to move. It's reactive. Oh, reactive. yeah. Reactive. Uh-oh. Hey, BlackBerry uh, possibly has made another foul step. Their shares are struggling again. BlackBerry has fallen 16% after it announced that they abandoned a plan to sell itself to its biggest shareholder, Fairfax Financial Holdings. Instead, it intends to raise $1 billion. Uh, for those of you in pounds, that's about 627 million pounds in fresh financing. Now, Chief Executive Thorsten Hines is going to step down, and the former Sybase Chief Executive John Chen is going to serve as interim chief executive. So we'll have to see what happens there. I wonder if the success of BlackBerry's uh, BBM product on other platforms has kind of made them think, oh, well, maybe we do have a following and we can, we can do this. Guys, we can do this. What do you think? Those are the top stories. That's it. <laughs> Neatly folded Back to into 1080p. 1080p. <laughs> there we go. Where can we get the full stories, Erica? Well, you guys can get the full stories at the Category 5 slash newsroom. This week, the Category 5 uh, dot TV newsroom is researched by Roy, Roy W. Nash with contribution by our community of viewers. And if you have any news stories that you think is worthy of an on-air mention, email newsroom at, cat at category 5 dot TV. And for the cat Category 5 dot TV newsroom, I'm Erica Lalonde. Thanks, Erica. This is Category 5 Technology TV. That's our website, Category5.tv. Thanks for joining us tonight. Visit our website, Category5.tv. Get into the chat room. Erica's going at it like a berserker <laughs> over there, trying to keep up with all of your messages. Nice to see everybody <laughs> joining us. Uh, and let's, uh, let's take some viewer questions, Erica, if we could. I want to say hi to the Albu Albuquerque Turkey joining us in the chat room. Also, Agamotto, Bill777. I'm working through it alphabetical-like. Bob K 54 <laughs> You interrupt me whenever you got a question for me. Oh, Chas I got, Linux, nice to I see you. I got tons of questions. All right, I'm up to see Dave Maydew. Oh, okay. Hey, T Dennis Kelly. TN Frank. Good guy. So howdy, Robbie and all. I've recently hey, signed up for hey. Google. Yeah? Yeah. Hey, TN Frank. Yeah, man. So for Google Plus <laughs> account, so I could use... So I signed up for a Google Plus account. Yes. So I could use the uh, VOIP. VoIP. The VoIP. Voice over IP. Voice Telephoning over IP. on the internet. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And video chat servers that they offer for free. Uh, can cool. you talk a little bit about the difference between the Google Voice and the Google Hangout versions of calling? And mm. maybe talk about anything else that's new or exciting on Google+. Plus. Thanks for keeping up the great work. Um, your pal, Daryl. A.K.A. T. N. Frank. Cheers, T. N. Frank, or Tennessee Frank, I guess it is. Um, now, uh, I mean, that's a pretty vast question. I mean, what's yeah. new with Google Plus? <laughs> They're constantly changing things. They're always breaking things. It's always under beta, and you know, you're always having to learn the interface over again because they keep changing things. That's an evolving system, and that's how Google works until they've got something that's really, really awesome. And Google Plus is cool. As far as Google Plus versus Google Hangouts or pardon me, Google uh, Voice versus Google Hangouts. Google Voice, think of that as like Skype. So you're making calls uh, and you're able to talk to mom and dad when you're away at school and it's a free call and that's cool. Kind of private as far as that goes. Google Hangouts, on the other hand, it's what you would expect mm -hmm. from a Hangout. What, what do you do when you call up your friends and say, hey, you want to hang out? <laughs> you go to you know the pub or whatever and there's a bunch of other people there and you're sitting there and you're having a chat and other people are over here and you, it's not private at all. No. Everybody can hear what you're talking about. So a Hangout is pretty neat and it's kind of revolutionary because what was the downfall of Skype uh, as far as all of the users wanted this one feature? It was the ability to have 
group conversations. Now you can do it with audio, but you can't do it with video. So along comes Google uh, Hangouts and Hangouts on Air, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. Hangouts allows you to, in a group, uh, actually hang out, chat, and uh, have everybody come up on the screen. And it's intelligent in such a way that if I start talking, uh, which is known to happen, all of a sudden my face comes up on the screen. And then if Erica on her webcam halfway across the world starts talking, all of a sudden her webcam comes up on the screen. So that's pretty cool. Hangouts on Air, on the other hand, is also interconnected with YouTube. So now you've got not just the people with webcams who can talk to each other and hang out, but you've also got on air portion, which is people being able to watch the Hangout on YouTube live. And that means they are unable to interact as far as bringing up their webcam and chatting with you, uh, but they can watch what's going on in the actual Hangout itself. So. That's kind of cool. Google's evolving uh, G+, though, and it's always uh, getting better and better. Uh, try to keep up. It's a lot of fun to learn the platform. And, of course, we have uh, our Google Plus profile at cat5.tv slash G+. That's actually spelt out G-P-L-U-S. Thanks for the question. We have a- another question from Carl uh, Cunningham. Hey, Carl. Um, so... He's saying that I carry a flash drive uh, back and forth between home and work and okay. sometimes uh, put sensitive files on it. Of course. Uh, in Linux, what method would you recommend to encrypt the file system or the mm. individual files so that I, it can be accessed in case I lose it? Yeah. Um, well, TrueCrypt seems like the obvious choice, uh, but I'm going to show you a, a tool um, that is part of your Linux operating system. You can install it with Synaptic Package Manager. If you're on a Debian-based system, um, we're using apt-get uh, as the back-end Synaptic Package Manager to install. I'll just bring that up. This is how easy it is to install stuff on Linux. It's great. Um, there's a couple of little packages here that I'm going to need for, for you, Carl. First of all, we're going to go... Now, I'm on Mate, which is a GNOME 2 fork, uh, but I'm going to see if we can get uh, GNOME Disk Utility to work even though I'm on Mate and not on GNOME. Okay, there we go. So GNOME Disk Utility exists in my repository. That's good. Mark for mark the changes. Yeah. Okay, now that's going to give us, you know, the classic GNOME Disk Utility, which allows us to format disks, create uh, uh, software RAID arrays, things like that. Really, really great utility. You should have it anyways. I'm not sure why I don't have it installed. Maybe just I deployed the system and never thought of it. Um, so that's cool. GNOME Disk Utility. Got it. Now, next one we want, because you're specifically asking for encryption, we're going to look for crypt setup. There it is. Let's install that. And that's actually going to give encryption features to the GNOME disk utility. And we're going to mark that, and we're going to apply. That's going to download everything that we need for those two utilities through the web connection. I don't have to use any disks. That's what's beautiful about Linux and and the way that uh, you know I don't have to go out onto websites and try to find all these programs to install and compile them and get them installed onto my system. No, I just simply, uh, that's it. I just use Synaptic and it installs it. There it goes. Almost there. Now, I don't have a flash drive connected to my computer, so I can't actually mm -hmm. show you the process of doing it with a flash drive, but I'm going to bring up the application all the same, and we'll see if, uh, if we can get there. But you're going to find the, uh, the option to encrypt now that I've installed Crypt Setup as well as GNOME Disk Utility uh, in the format option. So what you would do is back up the files on your flash drive uh, to your hard drive or whatever, then format using the GNOME Disk Utility and check off the box for, <laughs> pardon me, for uh, encryption. It'll ask you for the password, nice and simple. So, disk utility, where are you? I don't think that's the command to run it. Let's see if we can find it on the menus if it's given it to us. There's gparted. No disk utility, where are you? Where are you? Ah. Okay, well, I know that I've installed it. So let's do a quick search. I'm going to do a quick search to see what the executable is. Unless one of you in the chat room knows what the executable is for that, because I don't see it having been added to my menu, but we can run it with Alt F2. Disk utility. 
command. How's that? How to get it from a terminal? That works. Pal imp cest. Of course. <laughs> I, I should have not guessed. known that. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to have to run it as a uh, super user do. Huh. How did I not know that off the top of my head? Okay, so we're going to go GK sudo, and then the command apparently is P-A-L-I-M-P-S-E-S-T. Let's try it. Yes, we got it. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if I were to format a drive, so if I brought up a drive uh, and clicked on format over on the right-hand side, you'll see now I've got encrypt underlying device. How cool is that? So it will actually encrypt the volume so that when you have it, you know, in transit, you don't have to worry about the files. It's protected by a key. As soon as I click that and hit format, it's going to ask me for the key that I want to enter. It's a good, strong password. Mm -hmm. We've learned about how to create those on the show. And then you can go from there. Keep in mind, now you're going to have to install these packages on both computers, where you're going, where you're, where you're coming to. Um, and you're going to have to use this utility in order to mount and unmount the device because it's encrypted. So with that device now, you're going to have to actually use the mount features of this particular application, GNOME Disk Utility. So you, my friend, are going to have to memorize the command or create a shortcut. How's that? We've got time for maybe one more question. Thanks for the question, Carl. Um, we have a question from Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Uh, so, hey, I have finalized a mini DVD. Nice. And I was wondering how to use the DD command to save my hard drive so I could take the media on the disk and burn it to regular size oh, yeah. DVD. Okay. And thanks. Yeah, it's actually, su pardon me, surprisingly, oh, surprisingly easy. I'm going to go into terminal. I don't have a mini DVD to test with, but I can always just show you. So what we need to do is determine the location of the disk itself. The way that you can do that is mount it in your system. So basically what I mean by that is put it in, put it in the drive. Your computer is going to recognize that it's a DVD. It's going to probably launch. It's going to start playing, or it might just bring up a, you know, the computer window where you can browse the files. Either way, it's now mounted. So now we can use the mount command to find out, well, what's the actual location of that? So we go sudo mount. And that tells me all of my file systems. And I can see that, OK, well, I'm going to have a particular device that is, you know, here's my hard drive, for example. See, that's mounted on slash. So once you know the device, right? So the first part, this is the device itself. This is the mount point. So you, you'll know that it's like slash media slash DVD or something. So then you copy this whole line here, and that's the device itself. And I'm just, I, I don't have a DVD in there, so I can copy my hard drive anyways. And I, I would go DD IF equals, that stands for in file, or input file, and then paste my device. And that's with the full path, so slash dev slash disk, whatever it happens to be. And then you guessed it, OF for out file equals... And wherever you want to put that, so let's say we want to put it on tilde, which is your home folder. So slash home slash Robbie, for example, uh, slash desktop with a capital D slash, or if I just want to put it in the, the current folder, OF for out file equals, um, you know, my DVD, don't put any spaces, dot ISO. That's going to create an ISO file, which is now an image of a DVD. So you can take that, you can open it with Bracero, you can burn it on any computer that has a disk burning software, and you can burn it to a standard size DVD, no problem. You can also share the ISO file, put it on your uh, set-top box, and you'll be able to watch, uh, no problem, just like that. So there you have it. Thanks for the question. I think that's all the time that we have, if you can believe. Well, that's it. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for all your questions, folks. And there's still tons more. We'll Does have to continue fly, that eh? to next week. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we would like to say hello to all of our viewers on YouTube, Blip TV, Micro Internet, First Run TV, and Ruku, and etc. Awesome. Hey, if you like the Net Talk Duo, I'm talking free phone calls anywhere in Canada, Canada or the USA. So. Mm -hmm. 
You get one of these and you can call anywhere in Canada or US, no charge. Get two of these, send one of them overseas to the UK or Netherlands or wherever you want to go. Let's say we send it to a friend in Germany. Mm -hmm. Now we can call each other absolutely free. Really? Because we both have one. So you activate it in Canada or the US and now we can communicate, you send it over and they can plug it into their internet and we've got voice over IP phone with a real handset phone and we can call anywhere. No more calling cards. Huh. No, and it's free. <laughs> so we've got these with three months of free long distance service. All you have to do is go to cap5.tv slash studio and make a contribution with that particular perk. Because when you contribute to Category 5 TV, we're actually giving you stuff as well. And that's one of the perks. You'll be able to receive three months of free service with a NetTalk Duo 2 device. You're going to have this. So then after the three months are over, oh, well, it's going to cost a thousand bucks. No, only $3.35 per month. For unlimited long distance calling. That's like a tax on a calling card. It's like a couple of cups <laughs> of coffee a month and you've got unlimited calling. How do you like that? So cat5.tv slash studio. We've got some amazing perks there from some of our friends and partners. Uh, and uh, we'd encourage you to please support Category 5 TV in this really, really exciting time. So thanks for joining us tonight. Erica, nice to see you as always. It's good to see you guys. And have a good night, Robbie. And have a good night, thanks. everyone. Take care, everybody. See you next week. We hope you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.